Uh, this question is for Rabbi. Um, you mentioned the story of, of that, uh, I, I think you said he was Jewish and he was shot by, uh, at that, I, I think it was a concentration camp or something like that. And I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a bit and pretend I'm Sam Harris. No pun intended, of course. Um, you stated that God was watching. God watched the gentleman pull the trigger. If God was watching, why didn't he make that trigger not work? Why didn't he make that poor individual just pass out while he was digging the grave? Uh, okay. I believe Sam Harris would ask that type of question and demand an answer. Yes, I appreciate that question. Um, the Playing the devil's advocate, you said that why didn't God keep the man from pulling the trigger rather than allowing the man to pull the trigger and then watch over him and uh, bringing about some kind of judgment? I would say this to you, that the supreme ethic that God has given to us is the ethic of love. It is the peak of of all intellectual and emotional alignment. This thing we call love, which places value upon the other person of worth and as something to be protected. It was interesting of all people, it was Oscar Wilde who on his deathbed in his 40s, by his lover by his side, Robbie Ross, he turned to Robbie and he said, did you love any one of those little boys for their own sake? It was an incredible question to ask by a man who was a hedonist on his deathbed in his 40s. And he said, Robbie, did you ever love any one of those little boys for their own sake? And Robbie Ross said, no, I can't say I did. He said, bring me a minister, bring me a minister. And it was in his magnificent poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, that Oscar Wilde said, only Christ was big enough to cleanse his heart and forgive him for all that he had done. The point even the hedonist realized was that in pleasure also, value, and love are the supreme ethics that can be treasured. But you can never have love without intrin intrinsically weaving into it the freedom of the will. You cannot have love without the freedom of the will. If you are compelled by some machine to a certain decision, you can never love. You can comply but you will never be choosing to express that sentiment and the reality of love. If love is a supreme ethic and freedom is indispensable to love and God's supreme goal for you and for me is that we will love him with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves, for him to violate our free will would be to violate that which is a necessary component so that love can flourish and love can be expressed. If you're asking for God to always stop the trigger, why not God stop everything else? Next time you hold a cup of boiling water, he makes it frozen water instead. Next time you're about to cross the street and you're gonna be hit, he pulls your leg back. What you're asking for is a different entity than humanity. As wonderful as it may seem that in stopping that you think he is protecting you from that which is destructive, the greatest denial that you're asking for is the freedom of your will to be able to choose and to love God with all your heart and all your soul. When you've got love as the supreme ethic and the freedom of the will to choose that love, all of the other contingencies come in and can become explained why it is possible to either choose or to reject so that love can ultimately reign supreme. If you want compliance and, a and some kind of a mechanical response, your question itself will self-destruct. You're asking the question because you're free to ask it, and you're free to ask it because you're free to love. And when you love him, in spite of all of the contraries that you see around us, you're trusting him for having the supreme wisdom and the knowledge to ultimately bring a pattern out of it all. We think, for example, we know so much. 
The story is told in Mideastern folklore of this man who lost his horse that ran away. And when the horse ran away, the neighbor came to him and said, you know, bad luck, isn't it? Your horse is gone. He said, what do I know about these things? A few days later, the horse came back with 20 other wild horses. And the neighbor came and said, amazing, it's not bad luck, it's good luck. You've got 20 more. The man says, what do I know about these things? His young son is going and taming one of the new horses. That young horse kicks him and breaks his leg. The neighbor comes and says, terrible, isn't it? Your son's leg is broken. Bad luck that these horses came. The fellow says, what do I know about good luck and bad luck? A few days go by and a bunch of thugs are coming, looking for recruits to join their gang. And they're looking for all the able-bodied young men. And they're about to pick this young man, but find out his leg is broken. And they say, we don't want him. We're going to move on to the next house. So the man comes and says, good luck, isn't it? Your son's leg was broken. In one little series of episodes, we don't know what lies ahead. Why don't you wait till you stand before God face to face and you will find out there were reasons why he didn't stop that trigger so that you will see the heinousness of evil and see the majesty of love and good managing to navigate yourself by the, as a pilgrim's progress to come to the <laughs> celestial city.